The guava moth is a native of Australia and arrived in New Zealand in 1997. Since then, it's halted Fiji exports out of Northland. In addition, it could threaten a range of other commercial crops, such as stone fruit, citrus and nuts, as it moves further south. Tracy Bain is a kirikiri based grower with 1,800 Fiji trees on her property. The guava moth affects us quite badly with the early varieties in March, especially unique. They get a lot of premature drop. Then it seems to get itself better, but I would say from the whole crop we probably lose about 10% to the guava moth. Oh, here's our uh, trap. Here we go. Let's see what we've got in here. Whoa. We've got a good catch here. <laughs> Haven't some we of just... these, um, aren't guava moth. No, I've caught everything. But, yeah. Mm. We spray Calypso, but it hasn't really worked. Nothing has worked so far. The problem is you're never going to get rid of it now, so a control would be the way to go. For the last few years, there's no exports coming out of Northland. Um, as it gets further down south, I think the growers down south will start feeling the pinch a wee bit more. But yeah, there's no exports coming out of here because I can't guarantee that no guava moth is going to go past our checks and balances. A moth lays an egg on the surface of the fruit and sometimes around the calyx end and the first stage caterpillar or larva just comes straight out of the egg and burrows straight into the fruit and uh, you can see a wee uh, sort of like we call a sting or an indentation, very hard to detect uh, at, at the initial stages and then the bruising can appear as the larva grows bigger. We can just see the entrance where the early stage larva has come in. You get this little sort of little bit of damage here in the, in, the, in the skin, and from there it will move as it grows, spreads right into the fruit. This is just as the fruit is starting to ripen. The guava moth times her egg laying perfectly so that the fruit ripens as the larva develops. Then it causes the fruit to drop to the ground early, prematurely, and the development continues on in the fruit, and you get an exit hole. When the grub or the larva reaches about 10 mils, it will then move from the ground where the fruit has fallen onto the ground, moves into the debris underneath the tree and forms a loose cocoon where it gathers up loose leaves and sticks. So you get a little cocoon like that underneath your fruit tree and then the moth hatches out from there and um, is ready to go again. The moth is very small and insignificant, very difficult to tell from just many other moths you may see around your orchard. This is a monitoring tool so that we can tell where it's spread to. If we have a suspicion that it's in a new area, then we will hang one of these up and then determine whether guava moth has been caught. It's not a control option. The best option, if you're wanting them identified, is to wrap the sticky base in Glad wrap and send it to an entomologist for identification. Once it's finished with the, the guavas and the fijoas and this time of year, we'll then move on to lily pili. Infest a lot of these fruit, and there are thousands produced by trees. A lot of these alternative hosts are just our roadside weeds, including fijoa hedges, lily pili hedges, loquats, feral loquats, and these are all hosts to guava moth. And so basically guava moth can just move on to the next, uh, the next available crop. Up here in Northland, they're breeding all year round. They will slow down over winter because of slightly cooler temperatures, but otherwise they're just moving on. We don't know how far they fly. Research needs to be done. Here we can see where the larva has got right into the fruit. Brown chewing material where it's chewed. You can also get some added fungal pathogen associated with it. You can get the excreta, the frass, coming out its rear end. But basically, these are inedible. They spend their whole life inside the fruit once they leave the egg and burrow into the fruit. So they're well protected from insecticide. The best option, especially for home gardeners, it's not really going to happen for commercial orchards, but if you put um, a fine covered mesh over your fruit just as it's ripening, uh, just curtain mesh, 
and secure it to the top of the branch, you can stop the, uh, the female coming in and laying eggs on the fruit because she lays her eggs she on the fruit surface. So that's your best option. Other options can be just making sure you clear away all your fallen infested fruit off, your, off the uh, ground around uh, your, um, beneath your fruit trees. But there are no insecticides registered for use against guava moth. Oh, there yes. we go. You're getting your eye in now for detecting the, yeah. the, little, the bruising. I mean, the, the... It's that pinprick and it has a wee bit of a dimple. The hardest thing is teaching your workers to, to spot them when they're going over the grading machine. We also need all of the sectors to come together and all contribute to where we go next because at the moment we are struggling as far as what options we've got. Personally, I think it's biocontrol is, uh, is the way to go. Bring in, uh, try to reduce the fact that the guava moths got here without any predators or competitors or parasites. And if we could find a parasitoid in its uh, home range back in Australia um, that we could introduce safely to New Zealand, then I, pre I predict that would be the way to go. But also there has been, I have done some work with mating disruption as well using pheromones. Uh, in an orchard situation. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.